Hello, hi, welcome back to our latest chapter subset in uh, this anatomy discussion. In this um, chapter, we'll be discussing the peripheral cannulation uh, sites. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank Mr. Sonil Ori, our clinical lead and lead for education, Mr. Zabi Miskolci, our adult cardiac surgery consultant, as well as Mr. Suvitish Luthra, our senior surgical fellow. Um, in this chapter, I will not be going into details regarding the rationale, merits, and the pros and cons of various peripheral cannulation sites. Uh, this is left, um, uh, we will discuss this in more details in the aortic surgery chapter. However, just in brief, in a nutshell, the fundamental concept of peripheral cannulation is trying to establish uh, or institute cardiopulmonary bypass before opening the chest. This is quite useful in various situations such as, for instance, in dissections or aneurysms where you are worried upon the risks of uh, injuring the surface of the aorta or uh, suspecting hemodynamic instability during the uh, uh, opening uh, and institution of bypass. Also, uh, in redo surgeries for the same reasons where you are suspecting instability or inadvertent injury to the surface of the heart. Historically speaking, the first peripheral cannulation strategy was initially the uh, um, uh, femoral. It's still uh, very popular, very common in a lot of centers. Uh, however, uh, the only drawback of the femoral cannulation is you cannot establish cerebral protection uh, because of the uh, risk of uh, dislodging the debris and atheroma uh, uh, while the blood is traveling retrograde. Uh, although the femoral cannulation is very accessible, the femoral region anatomy is not intricate. It's easy to access and uh, fairly uh, more uh, least uh, uh, cumbersome uh, dissection process out of the three. Uh, next uh, was the evolve and with the evolution of understanding these um, cerebral protection strategies, cerebral perfusion strategies, hence the axillary artery started to take the lead. Um, uh, with this uh, particular strategy, you can uh, perform cerebral protection and cerebral perfusion using one cannula without having to shift your cannula. The carotid uh, peripheral cannulation, on the other hand, never uh, actually substituted either uh, neither the uh, femoral or the axillary. It is mainly it has its own indication, its own uh, population of use that is in the pediatric population, not in the adult population. Having said that, a lot of centers, uh, uh, a lot of aortic surgery centers in, uh, in Japan and Asia use the carotid cannulation as a primary uh, strategy for peripheral cannulations. We will explain why we, it's particularly useful in the pediatric population when we come to that. This is in brief an explanation of the, uh, in summary, and uh, of the peripheral cannulation, and we will discuss in further details when we come to aortic surgery chapter. Let's start uh, in a historical manner, in a, in a chronological manner. Let's start with the femoral cannulation. First point, always we orient ourselves to the area, the femoral triangle. We all know sartorius, adductor longus, the muscle bed is the iliopsoas pectinis and adductor longus muscle. Now, if you are dissecting from uh, superficial to deep, you will be faced with some superficial structures you need to be uh, uh, familiar with and oriented with. One is the uh, junction of the saphenofemoral uh, uh, saphenous with the femoral uh, vein. Next are the three superficial inguinal veins, then the two uh, uh, cutaneous nerves, that is the uh, two, uh, sorry, sensory nerves, that is the ilioinguinal and the uh, uh, and the uh, femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve. Um, Inadvertent injury to the ilioinguinal nerve leads to hypothesia or parathesia along the inguinal region. The femoral uh, branch of the genitofemoral nerve provides cutaneous supply to the front of the thigh and the lateral part of the thigh, uh, uh, sorry, the front of the thigh, leading to hyperthesia or parathesia in this region. Um, if you dissect a little bit more deep, you find yourself in front of the femoral sheath, which is a three compartmental sheath comprising three main structures. We all came to a point when we got a bit uh, confused regarding the uh, proper orientation of the structures within the femoral sheath. Don't uh, be disappointed, that's completely natural. Um, as we are used in this series, I will uh, provide you with a little story to remind you with this uh, particular detail. So, 
if you look here, the femoral canal is sitting in this particular point for, to serve a purpose. That is, the femoral vein is one of the veins of the body which is most susceptible to engorgement. Like in females, for instance, due to pregnancy or in males due to muscular exercise, the presence of the femoral canal in this area allows a space, a buffer space for the femoral uh, uh, vein to engorge. The uh, position of the femoral nerve outside the femoral cheese again is uh, for a, a rational gap made this to protect the femoral nerve from the continuous lifetime pulsations of the femoral artery. Uh, if they were both com uh, com uh, uh, entrapped within the same uh, femoral uh, uh, sheath uh, along a lifetime, this will lead to neuritis due to the continuous pulsations of the femoral artery. I hope this helps you to, to remember the structure and orientation of structures within the femoral uh, uh, sheath. Now, um, the fundamental question, the fundamental take home, uh, um, uh, take home message we, we aim for in this series, uh, in this uh, chapter is understanding where to cannulate, where and how to cannulate. In order to understand that, you need to uh, um, uh, digest and understand the, uh, let me rewind a little bit here. You need to understand the, uh, uh, basic uh, uh, branches, course, and relations of the uh, various uh, um, vascular beds. So if you look at the uh, uh, vascular tree in the femoral, femoral uh, circulation, as you can see here, the uh, femoral uh, tree consists of the common femoral artery so, and then divides into two branches, one deep, one superficial, the profunda femoral or the deep branch and the superficial femoral artery. The uh, common femoral artery itself gives out the uh, superficial inguinal branches, that is the superficial circumflex iliac, superficial external pudendal and superficial uh, epigastric artery. The profunda femoris gives the medial and lateral circumflex humoral, uh, femoral arteries as well as the perforators. The superficial femoral on the other hand uh, uh, pierces the adductor hiatus and the adductor magnus and travels behind into the popliteal fossa as the popliteal artery, which later on divides into the common perineal, uh, the common perineal and the common tibial uh, arteries. Those are the terminal two branches. Now, where is the the best point of uh, of uh, cannulation? This is obviously the best point. Why is that? If you, I think the diagram explains it all. If you clamp on either side and start dissecting in here and trying to uh, uh, establish the cannulation site, you will be faced with you will be punished with back flow from these uh, branches. Also, during the course of the surgery, you will end up with a continuously bleeding site. Uh, again, the same applies to this part. So this is the small window of opportunity you've got. Uh, you need to cannulate in this part. We're, uh, we're, cannulate, we're applying the clamps on either side will provide you with a completely bloodless uh, field, as you can see here. So if you apply the clamps and you're still faced with uh, back flow or back bleeding, so probably, most likely, you are either too high or too uh, low. Next is understanding a fundamental concept which applies to all peripheral cannulation strategies. So in here, as you can see, when we select the size of the cannula, we selected index to body weight. So um, sometimes, uh, even though we selected it index to body weight, the caliber of the femoral artery is not uh, big enough. And this leads to obstruction of the anti-grade flow precluding the anti-grade flow, only blood will travel this direction. The way forward from here, the way to uh, uh, treat this is you have two options. And this applies, again, as I said, to both peripheral cannulation strategies. First option is uh, stitching or anastomosing a, a, a tube graft, a synthetic tube graft to the side of the artery and inserting the cannula through this tube graft. Of course, this uh, has the problem of prolonging your surgery, uh, also adding one more anastomosis site which may bleed. The second option which is less cumbersome is using a cannula with a special sideway in which you can, uh, um, um, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, establish the anti-grade flow through. These are the two main options you have got in those particular situations. Um, next. 
is the axillary cannulation again starting from the beginning orienting ourselves to the area the axillary region as you can see here the axillary region is mainly a, a, is a, essentially a pyramid uh, in in your uh, basically the armpit it's an uh, it's a pyramid it's a pyramid which base is the armpit region the apex of which travels all the way up to the uh, inlet of the chest as you can see here the axillary artery travels obliquely from um, in an oblique fashion from top to bottom um, in this uh, part it's divided into three parts by the pectoralis minor in this part the uh, the axillary artery lies directly under the pectoralis major and the clavipectoral fascia fascia and then in this part it, uh, it lies underneath the pectoralis major pectoralis minor in here only covered by the pectoralis major in a in a brief uh, area the axillary artery is directly palpable under the skin and this you can even feel the pulsations in there um, this is very tempting uh, you might feel that this is very tempting for uh, the surgeon to cannulate at we will understand why it's not a good idea uh, this area is essentially caused by the fact that the lower border of the teres major travels lower than the lower border of the pectoralis major and hence creates this uh, deficient area where the axillary artery lies directly under the skin Looking at this area from the side to understand uh, more the orientation of the neurovascular bundle, as you can see here, the axillary artery lies directly behind the clavipectoral fascia. So, uh, uh, looking at this diagram, you understand that the portal to the axillary artery at this particular point is through the clavipectoral fascia. You need to understand what structures will you be faced when you start dissecting the clavipectoral fascia. As you can see here, three structures behind give out three structures piercing the fascia one is the thoracoacromial artery two is the lateral pectoral nerve three is the cephalic uh, uh, vein uh, however dissecting from the surface you will only be faced by two the remaining structures will uh, terminate their course at the uh, under surface of the pectoralis major these two structures are deltoid branch of the thoracoacromial artery and the cephalic uh, vein now uh, remember there are four branches to the thoracoacromial artery one a b c d a for acromial b for pectoral c for clavicular d for deltoid now um, again the fundamental question we need to answer uh, during this chapter is where is the best point of cannulation in order to understand that you need to understand the branches course and relation yes happy surprise branches course and relations actually do have clinical correlate they are not just made to torture med students um, the, as we said, the axillary artery is divided into three parts. Think about it that way. The answer is the first part, but let's see why. Um, as you can see here, the first part um, gives one branch, that is the uh, superior thoracic artery. The second part gives the two branches, that is the thoracoacromial artery and the lateral thoracic artery. Then the third part gives three branches, that is the uh, subscapular artery, circumflex femoral artery. How convenient. First one branch, second, two branches, third, three branches. By the way, a rhetorical question in here. We did discuss the internal mammary artery. If there is an internal mammary artery, what is then the external mammary artery? This is the external mammary artery. The lateral thoracic artery is also sometimes called the external mammary artery, simply because the mammary tissue, we mean the breast tissue in females, is supplied by the internal mammary from the medial side and the external or lateral thoracic artery from the external side or the lateral side. Hence, there is external and internal mammary arteries. Um, going back to our uh, uh, question, so where is the best point to cannulate? The answer is the first part. Why is that? First of all, there is only one branch. You can uh, simply easily isolate that. So you will end up with a bloodless uh, field where you can cannulate and avoid leaking throughout the uh, course of the surgery. The second part is definitely not a good choice. First of all, it's full of branches. You will not be able to isolate the field in here regardless of how many clamps you use. And also during the dissection process, you will probably end up injuring one of those branches and ending up spending time to hemosta for, for hemostasis. Also, it's behind the pectoralis minor, so you will have to uh, dissect another layer of muscle. Now, the third part is very tempting. We explained how the third part lies uh, in part of its course uh, directly under the skin. Why is not it's not a, a, an ideal uh, choice? If you look here, this is the answer. 
the orientation of the brachial cords around the axillary artery uh, brings these three cords around uh, over overwhelm the uh, the third part of the axillary artery from all three directions which makes it not an ideal point of uh, cannulation uh, last but not least is the carotid cannulation. Before we start, I would like to explain a point which we um, discussed earlier. Why the carotid cannulation uh, uh, mainly used in the pediatric population rather than the other population? So the question is, why not use the femoral or axillary in the pediatric population? Um, because the size of the cannula will almost uh, m might well or almost always will occlude or preclude the anterior uh, anti-grade flow. The two options which we discussed earlier are not feasible in the pediatric population because the anti-grade branches are actually smaller. So you will not be able to achieve a good flow and the, the technique as, as well is cumbersome. But the question here is if you cannulate then the carotid, is there no risk to preclude the anti-grade flow? Yes, there is a risk. However, um, you rely on the fact or the concept of a complete circle of Willis. So the complete circle of Willis hopefully will save you uh, during this situation. And by the way, the incomplete circle of Willis occurs or uh, incidentally is found in 0 to 5 percent of the population. So um, we bite the bullet, we hope for the best, and uh, we, we preferably cannulate through that uh, um, pathway, uh, through that uh, uh, carotid uh, strategy. Also. Uh, the carotid cannulation is not uh, the ideal uh, strategy in adults because of the risk of atheroma and uh, the atheromatous burden and debris, so you risk inducing stroke. However, in the pediatric population, this is not uh, um, a valid risk. We mainly use the carotid cannulation in the pediatric, uh, in most centers, in establishing ECMO. Um, think about it, ECMO is the long-term bypass, so if you need to put someone on bypass for a few days, ECMO is your choice. This is in brief, as we said earlier, a lot of centers in Japan and Asia use the carotid cannulation as the uh, first line of peripheral cannulation. In brief, understanding the anatomy, as you can see, the carotid triangle bounded by the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, the posterior border of the uh, homohyoid, and the posterior border of the digastric muscle at the side of the neck. So your aim during the dissection is to flip or to unwind the uh, anterior border of the sternomastoid and hopefully you will find the carotid cheese in there. Um, looking at it in a cross section, as you can see, it is wedged between the posterior border of the thyroid gland, the sternomastoid, and the paravertebral uh, uh, muscles. The carotid sheath itself uh, uh, encompasses three structures, that is the common carotid, the internal jugular, and the vagus nerve. Now I need to stop here for a second. So what, uh, what is this nerve on the surface of the carotid sheath? This is essentially the ansa cervicalis, three motor muscles which supply the infrahyoid uh, muscles. And a rhetorical question in here, what happens if you inadvertently injure the ansa cervicalis? The answer is nothing. Uh, the uh, the infrahyoid muscles um, are meant to um, uh, um, are auxiliary muscles of the glutition swallowing. The uh, primary muscles are the pharyngeal constrictors. Uh, inadvertently injuring the ansa cervicalis uh, will lead to paralysis of these infrahyoid muscles. However, the function is not uh, affected because of the same uh, uh, pharyngeal uh, constrictors. Uh, this explains why uh, the um, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is to explain that uh, the um, that's why we can use the ansa cervicalis as a substitute or as a, 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 um, um, a flap uh, in case of recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries uh, because you can sacrifice it you can take it out without losing its action also it is very convenient uh, because it gets the same neurological impulse during swallowing and phonation um, because it, uh, it supplies the infrahyoid muscle and hence you can use it as a substitute to the recurrent laryngeal nerve as a surgical treatment of injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve which is a topic we will discuss in thoracic surgery um, this is uh, about it. 
regarding the cannulation site. I hope you uh, you found this uh, um, chapter useful. I'll leave you now with this MCQ question and hopefully we'll meet in the next chapter. Thank you very much. Thank you.